Welcome to the Seminole Wars. In this podcast, we explore how the Seminole Wars came to be, how they were fought, and how they still resonate some two centuries later. I am your host, Patrick Swan, and our show is a production of the Seminole Wars Foundation, found online at www.seminolewars.us. We are recording today from the homestead of the Foundation in Bushnell, Florida. Thank you for listening. Hello and welcome. Since the 1980s, native-born and self-taught artist Jackson Walker has gathered subjects from the long saga of Florida history. With his thorough research, consulting with historians and experts on any given subject, and with painstaking attention to detail, Jackson Walker renders his stories in his traditional, realistic style. He pays particular attention to the Seminole Wars, 1818 to 1858, through which his many depictions represent the terrible human cost of those conflicts. Jackson has been most generous with his time in paintings to the Seminole Wars Foundation, of which he's both a past president and life member. However, his interests range much wider, leading him to tell Florida's history with paintings portraying Ponce de Leon's landing 500 years ago, the free black forts at Fort Mose and Prospect Bluff, and continuing through the 20th century, iconic Florida writers Zora Neale Hurston and Marjorie Rawlings grace his canvases. He even captured a World War II U-boat attack on the Florida coast. One can view his paintings at thejwstudio.com. And here, one can listen to Jackson Walker talk about the process he uses to paint his stunning art. And before we're done with our talk, Jackson will describe how his paintings have been turned into wearable art. Jackson Walker, welcome to the Seminole Wars. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to finally be here and take part. Have you always had a creative streak like this? Looking back on it now, I think I always had that feeling about wanting to make something, even when I was a a small child. But I didn't know what the foundation for that desire was. I was just always interested in stuff, interested in what things looked like, how they moved, that sort of thing. But I had no foundation for it until... This was back about, oh, early 50s. Uh, my parents and I went to Silver Springs up in Ocala, and I was just a little guy. Of all of that going on there, back then they had carnival atmosphere about it, and one of the things they had was a guy that drew portraits for money. And I went over and I watched him, and I got fascinated, and I found out what he used and how he did what he did. And so from that day, I had the feeling, well, this is how I've got to do this. With that little bit of information, I remember laying on the floor with a pad and colored pencils and just trying to do what that guy did. It just obsessed me. And ever since then, I always wanted to make pictures. And it was just a matter of how to do that. And that's been the lifetime's uh, experience is trying to learn how to make them pictures. It's been an ongoing journey, as you probably would guess. And once you got this bug, you can't shake it? I'm still learning. I'm still as much a student as I've ever been, and probably will be, because it's one of those things that you chase it forever. Even the best artists will tell you, I'm not there yet. (laughs) Of course they are. (laughs) But no, that's basically the kind of the, uh, I don't know if you'd call it the curse, but it's the thing that obsesses you probably more than anything else. How did your interest in movie making inform how you set up a scene that you're going to paint? When I was younger, a teenager and forward, I was fascinated with movie making. I thought, wow, this is great. I could have people dress up the way I want them to. I could make them do all kinds of stuff. I would have lights, camera, action, sound, music. And I could just see recreating and, of course, History was the foundation. And, you know, boy, I would love to do this with about the battle of this. or And it just filled my mind with images. I never got rid of that. Every time I've had a direction change in my life, I've always thought, remember everything about this experience because there may be help in it for you. Jackson, talk about your circumstances as you graduated high school. I was under some unfortunate circumstances when I was younger, so I didn't have a lot of break. I didn't have a lot of future, actually, at all. I was coming to the end of my high school years. My father had passed, and uh, there was not much for me to do 
And as you probably would guess, my draft status in 1965 was 1A. I'd go to look for a job after high school graduation and people would just laugh at you. So finally I said, well, I guess I know where I need to go. And I hitchhiked up to the recruiter and I say, I hear you guys have been looking for me and joined Uncle Sam's army. Spent three years in the army and the motivation there was, well, I'll uh, get my GI Bill and I'll go to art school and life will be great. And it didn't work out anything like that. What specialty did you sign up for? 11E10. That's a tank crewman. <laughs> yeah, you can go in the Army, man. They even put you in a graphics school and you can. And I decided if I'm going to have to go in the Army, I'm going to do something Army. I'm not going to do a desk job or I'm going to do something really uh, Army so I can talk about that when I'm an old man. I chose artillery first. I was going to be a cannoneer, but my eyes wouldn't hold up to that. So they said, you have a second choice. What would you like to do? And I said, well, I would just be in a, a volunteer. They, quote, give you a choice to what you would like to pursue. So I said, I think I would like to go into tanks because that's be fascinating things. You'd never drive a tank anywhere except in the Army. And I thought, well, that's what I want. So I ended up going in there and I went to tank school and uh, joined a cavalry regiment and went to Vietnam. Ended up being transferred from there into a TDY operation that got me into, uh, it was a lucky break through my artwork. Somebody noticed it and asked me to do some jobs for them for headquarters. I thought, well, okay, it'll get me out of this. I did a series of cartoons for the commanding officer for his going away present for going home. It really struck a nerve. In payment, they said, how would you like to have a job in Saigon? And I said, well, I'd like that very much. They pulled some strings and they got me a job as a map maker and a review and analyst, which is making charts and, and graphs and maps for commanders to have their meetings and planning type thing. I'm sure you've seen that sort of thing before. And all I really had to do was just stand up there and move graphs and point with a pointer. It was great duty. I was in Saigon. And then all of a sudden I woke up and it was Tet. <laughs> I was in that from the first shot. And I was in downtown Saigon for fighting that thing for at least a week and a half without a lot of success. After that, it got to be scary. It never was that good again. So I figured I'd just do my time and get out of the Army, go home and go to school and be an artist. That was a plan, but actually things work out for the best. I'm glad I didn't go to art school because... If you're self-taught, somebody has to teach you how to use the tools and what procedures you go through to get the results you want. But generally, it's a matter of just doing it over and over and trying again and practicing. And it's like a musical instrument or somebody that's a dancer or a, an athlete. That It's all the same thing. You just have to stay at it and practice. And I know that sounds like reading a Wheaties box, but it does. it's true. You really have to just put your heart into it and just do it until you can do it. That's the one lesson I learned. And I don't regret not going to school at all. I think my abilities would have been just as valid, however that worked out. The important thing is, is I just, uh, I'm just glad it worked out like it. And I'm glad I got home. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I ended up three years in the Army, two tours in Vietnam, and finally got out of that. And I still could see no break to get into art school because the VA was just overloaded with applications at that time and everything. So I kind of lost my way. But I had to work, and I had just enough raw ability to draw that it got me in a few doors. I ended up working for a newspaper, selling ad space and things like that, but worked into the graphic arts department and kind of lied my way into the business, but learned on the job picking people's brains on how to do this 
And I know I wanted to stay as close to being an artist as possible because I still had those paints with me all the time. I would go into an advertising agency or a print shop and tell them, oh, I, yeah, I can do that, sure. And then hope I could get through the day <laughs> and nobody would ask me to do that particular thing. Over the time, I got to be pretty good at it because the artist made up for some of the other lesser uh, abilities that I had. Over the years, I got pretty good at illustration and cartooning and designing and was pretty useful in that field. Still use a lot for my own jobs and for uh, other things. I've done some for the foundation and everything. So it kept me through the non-painter years. And then finally, when we moved up here to Orlando back in the late 80s, my wife had acquired a really good job, so we were in fairly good shape. I decided I would like to try doing it full time. It's going to take that to get this acquired. So I would beg you to let me take a shot at it. And of course, being my wife, and I love her to death, she said, yeah, you know, now's the time you, you go do it. And so far, it's been an up and down ride, but uh, those pictures keep getting done, and that's really what it's all been about. It does take time, and you need all the time you can get to make it a success. You just work on it until it's done. There is no more. I've worked on paintings for years. I've gone back and forth to them, but I've had paintings on the easel for a long time. And a lot of that time, it just takes that kind of time because of the size and the detail and not being able to get research when and as much as you might need that can slow you down. Because when you do historical work, you owe it to your clientele that you do the very best at your research. Because that's the value of historical art is to be real. You know? How hard is it to set a price for a painting that you've done? An artist, or at least me as an artist, I don't know really what my work is worth in dollars and cents. I really have no idea. To me, they're priceless. They're my babies, and I love every one of them, and I don't let bad ones get out of the studio. And try and keep the, the quality high enough so that if I have to ask a high price, I can back it up. I can say, well, look, it's a one-of-a-kind item. It's the very best I can do. There's a lot to this. But as far as money, wow, it's always been a problem because your natural thought is, well, you know, everybody's as poor as I am, so I'm not going to push it too much. How does the commissioning part work then? One of the nicest things is that people approach me with an offer and usually it's just fine. We can work out any fine line details as far as how the negotiations go and everything. The main thing is, is just to make sure they're getting what they expect and I get the time to do it. Usually works out real good. I've had some very happy clients and some successful work. I don't know if I have the answer to that or not, but you try and get through it. I sell prints to make up for some of the thin areas when there isn't a commission in the works. But I've been lucky that way. I've gotten some good commissions, and I've also been lucky in that when I show, I usually sell a couple of pieces at a show, and that really helps. But of course, the trick there is to, to get a show. There's all kinds of things involved in what these things cost. I know I'm probably underpriced myself because I want the business. That's the other thing, too, because I tend to get, especially if it's something I want to do. Somebody comes and says, I have this painting that I have in, in mind, and, and it's just something that just magnificent, spectacular participants, glorious, imaginative scene. that They get me so excited, I almost pay them to do it. And that's not good salesman. That is not great. So I tend to just take that very carefully and very seriously. I negotiate my work individually with whatever the circumstances might call for. Some people really need to have that painting, but they just haven't got the money. So maybe there's something that we could work out, that kind of thing. It's always served me well. I'm just interested in paying the bills and making sure these paintings stick around a long time. Other than that, it's just the joy of painting them pictures. 
Talk to us about marketing or just displaying your art in a show. Before the pandemic issues and everything, I was getting pretty active. I was doing a lot of shows in South Florida, down in Stewart, which is my hometown. But I had a couple of shows in some really good museums down there. Before I even moved up to Orlando, I lived in Stewart. And I did a painting down there, and I entered it. Nowadays, I'd never dare to do that, but I entered it in the Society of the Four Arts annual exhibit, thinking, well, you know, maybe. And sure enough, they accepted it. So I got into a really high-dollar show. The director of the museum purchased it for his collection. I was on cloud nine, but there's a lot of history coming down the pike that I hadn't experienced yet. The top of the line is when you can get into an art museum where they're prepared to do this thing because it's show business and you have to impress people or you're not going to get any response. So I always think of my exhibits as show business. And when I can get professional help, it's so great. I had a show at the Appleton Museum in Ocala, which is another very established museum, and they put on a really nice show. And then there was other lesser shows at schools and libraries and history centers all over the state, actually. That's what you want. Like I say, there's a very strong prejudice against artists that do realistic paintings. The art world that's making the big bucks wants something entirely different. I'm sure you've seen representatives of what art is these days. And if you're like me, man, I can't go that you know, that's some pretty weird stuff, and I don't know how it sells, but it does. And it also brings a strong prejudice. Even art schools seem to discourage the ability, the education of drawing and making artwork in a realistic form, because that's passe. That's no longer, we don't do that. It's a shame, because the whole art world seems is like that sometimes. And you know, when you open the door to go in and visit, you're in the wrong place. Some of the stuff they pass off as art is ridiculous. I mean, just embarrassing. However, they're getting five, six figures for that stuff. You think, wow, and I spent all those years learning how to push a pencil. But I'm not sorry. I stick by that. I'm an artist because I can paint pictures. And that's just about all I need. I don't have a whole lot of respect, and they, for me, with what you might call academic modern art scene. I'm an outcast to the art world. I'm just an old guy that paints pictures. I go for the secondary market, like historical organizations, for example. There's always an interest for my work in these things, you know. As long as I got that, I'm doing pretty well. I don't need those high-dollar art galleries that just easier to go where you want. It. <laughs> and I feel like I'm doing a lot better work than what I could ever do as one of them. People who see your artwork displayed at a museum in a special show, how do they let you know they'd like to buy one of them? If I'm showing publicly, they contact me and they say, no, is that particular piece for sale? Usually it is. I tell them, yeah, you would like to talk about buying it. I have a card ready and I give them a card and say, let's talk about it. I don't like to try and negotiate during a show because there's just too much going on. Every once in a while, if I'm in an important show or a particular reason, I have this painting called The Gentry Line. It's a depiction of Richard Gentry at the Battle of Okeechobee. It was a commission for a guy here in Orlando, an attorney who was related to that family, and he wanted it for his family's legacy. So I had planned to have it brought down to the Okeechobee battle reenactment. I had his permission to do so and display it since it was right there on the scene. We could maybe market some shirts from it or something, but we couldn't get, there has to be insurance involved in something like that, and we couldn't get any support. That's things that are alert in the sidelines, that there's things like insurance and all those things that you have to, especially if it's not your work. But what I was getting to is that once in a while, if it's a special occasion and I'm able to, like with this case, I know this guy, I can borrow the artwork back for a show if they're willing to lend it for a period of time. 
I was hoping that someday we could do that with the Izzard painting. If there's some place that requires a show, we could take it over there and put it with the rest of my paintings, add more volume to the show. Other than that, surprisingly enough, I usually get a check, and if it's not sent in the mail, and the painting goes, and I never see it again. At some of the museums, like in Deland, they would purchase it, and I would receive my payment from the museum after they've negotiated the sale from the show. That's really the only kind of transaction that I would take during that time. Jackson, so you get a great feeling of accomplishment to finish a painting. But then you have to send it away. How do you feel about that? Oh, it's terrible. <laughs> Most of them, yeah. Now, I mean, I've got some that I just miss like a child. And others, well, you know, it, it was a good practice and it turned out okay. So farewell and do good things. But other than that, it's kind of difficult. And you spend so much time because you got to remember that no matter what the assignment is, that day that you sit down in front of this huge white square, and I tend to paint large for the most part, it is just a white square. And you know that when you're done, that's going to have to be something that is happening, that exists before somebody's eyes. And that can be a little intimidating, but it's also the greatest day in the world is to just look at that big old square and say, okay, let me get some paint on this thing and get go It's more fun to start out a painting than to finish it, really, because your mind just goes any and all different directions. I'm, well, now what if I move this over here? What if I did this? How about if I take this out? Just constantly, your mind's doing that. Throughout the whole process, you're constantly scrutinizing every stroke of that brush it's exhausting and it's frustrating a lot of times that doesn't come that easy and when it does it's really you go to bed thinking oh how am i going to ever solve that problem but you do and it does and generally speaking that's probably what i could say about that how do you keep track of all the paintings that you've completed what I've learned to do, when I finish a painting, I have a photographer that I take the work to, and he gives me a good set of high-quality reproduction because all artists need to have that. So I have a glossary of my work. Pretty much everything I've done in the past 30 or 40 years is in that glossary. And also my photographer that I work with has a backup glossary. But other than that, I don't really have much. I did do a book. I think you might have seen the book that the Florida Historical Society published for me. That's about the only record that I have. That's one of the downfalls of being an artist, of course, is you have to be seen. And without books or videos or that publicity that, that is required, and you're not seen, nobody knows who you are, and it can get pretty lonesome. You know? So the important thing is always uh, making sure that the work is available for people to see. That's why I like libraries so much, because uh, they're a good venue and they're available. Otherwise, the art world, if you could call it that, especially around Orlando area that I've been exposed to, is not all that excited about historical work and or military. Uh, it's a shame. They're more avant-garde. They're more modern. It's just a different animal than I am. So I don't have a lot of support either. So it can be lonesome sometimes. And the galleries that I've come across for, well, the, the commercial galleries especially are, are absolutely not interested in the kind of work that I do, which is okay. I'll move on. If uh, I can't play in their reindeer games, then I'll go play my own game. It's good to have outside organizations like the foundation or other organizations, garden clubs or something, that have an interest in this work that I do. And I depend on them. The Audubon Society is great. If you learn to do animals and birds and wildlife very, very well, mind you, that's a good place to get exposure. It's always a matter of just hunting around and finding a place that might want to show a Jackson Walker pick. And that's the way it pretty much it goes. You sell paintings, but who owns the art? Usually the ownership of the physical object, being the art in the frame, 
that you can hang on your wall is yours to do with whatever. But the reproduction of it for commercial or I don't know how far that reproduction restriction extends, but it protects your work from getting places that shouldn't be or they didn't pay for it to be and that everybody is compensated and happy. You own the art, you own the painting, you own the physical object. As for the image and the creativity that went into the painting, you still retain those rights. I make my photography, I zip off a copy to the Library of Congress and hold the copyrights to everything I do. That way I'm protected legally on the ownership of the artwork and I can sell or provide those rights to whomever that I choose to have them. So that's the way that works. Now, I'm not a lawyer, and with the Internet and everything, who knows how I'm protected. But I know as far as people making money off my artwork, without an agreement, it wouldn't be too fair, I don't think. So if it's a money-making deal, then we go to the table and we work out something that's beneficial for everybody, and then we go to work. Other than that, like a lot of times now, I get calls almost daily from people that different organizations, libraries, schools, all kinds. I make it a, a policy that if it's a nonprofit or a school or library or the government or anything that I can justify, I don't charge a price for that. I feel that they're doing me a favor and I'm doing them a favor. That's about all I can hope for for there. Just the exposure is payment enough sometimes. It's always been a dark hole that making a business out of being a painter. I will admit to that. It's fraught with mistakes. They can be expensive. So you always got to make sure that you treat everybody right and that everybody leaves the table with what they wanted. As long as that happens, I've not had a lot of trouble at all. I don't know what the legal answer to that is. I think it depends on the artist and the artist's representation, their lawyers, in other words, if they have such a thing. It's like bootlegging music. You put a piece of music online and you don't have the rights, chances are they'll come and get it and they'll send you a notice saying, don't do this. I've never had that happen. There was one time I think somebody was trying to sell copies of something I did but they were so awful that I wasn't going to worry about it too much. But I did make a point. I like a lot of work. If you're a client, usually what I would do is make sure you get a high-quality photograph along with your purchase as part of the documentation because that's for your insurance records. And you should have a copy that you can reproduce for family matters or just for your own good. You might want to send Aunt Hazel a reproduction of the painting. You got that. So I make sure that that's provided. But as far as commercial endeavors, like you take one of my works and you make prints or you use it in an advertisement of some kind or on a book jacket, any kind of commercial endeavor that can make money is something that you do have to consider. And I like to have some sort of contract or agreement drawn up for everybody's practicality. If you wanted to say, well, you know, people really love this painting, and I think I could make a whole great run of prints or postcards or whatever you think and make a little money, well, then the thing you would probably end up doing is we would work out a contract of you have the rights using this art for this job for X amount of compensation, and it's a done deal. I don't bother you, and uh, hopefully you make the money that you were hoping to. I've not had a bad experience to speak of. has been an issue about it. Other than that, that's been a real simple experience for me, usually just a cash deal and out the door. <laughs> you have said in the past some of your paintings have disappeared. What do you mean by that? The one that I did for the Georgia National Guard when they sent volunteers down here to protect Fort Cooper during the Second Seminole War, that one I have no copies of or anything, really. I've got one print that the National Guard had made up, but some of these paintings, a couple of them are gone. They just disappeared. I've got some paintings out there that I don't know what happened. They just got away from me, and they're in somebody's house somewhere. Oh, there was one that I did. I believe it's somewhere in the National Guard's collection because Bob Hawk saw it 
and loved it, wanted it for the collection, so we made a purchase agreement for that one. But it was a story, I don't know if you've heard of it or not, but there was a blockhouse that was built on the Withlacoochee River, and I don't remember a lot of the particulars because this was an early painting, but I did a painting from the story that I got, which was based on a Florida Historical Society story that was done some years ago. The scene was that they had built this makeshift blockhouse to protect themselves and what they were holding for the supplies for the troops that were supposed to meet them there. They were put upon by the warriors with flaming arrows, which I thought was a little unusual. I'd not heard of that being used very much. And I thought, well, there's a picture there. So I did that painting. The original is somewhere in the collection of the National Guard, but I don't know where, and I haven't seen it since. John and Mary Missile, who I've done a couple of book covers for, on occasion they have purchased the original of the book jacket art, and I think there's a couple of those that are in their collection that don't get seen very much. They have a pretty good collection of my stuff. That What you're asking is, is if there's any others out there, and none that I can really think of that haven't been either sold or displayed in one way or another. What is your fascination with big art? And tell us what that actually means to you. I always liked the idea of working on a big project. When I came up here, I didn't know anything about my family that had settled in this area. I was learning a lot about my own family as I was Seminole Wharf history. All of a sudden, it was like opening a book and having all these pages fly out of all these stories. I realized that Florida has an incredible history. You can tell it goes through all centuries and all kinds of circumstances. So what idea did you come up with? I thought, well, what if I did a big project and I called it legendary Florida, and I did a series of paintings based on stories of personalities and instances in Florida's history from all periods of time, but bound together as a story. I started, and it took years. I ended up with something like, oh, maybe 12, 13, 14 possibly paintings in the collection, and it was turning out really great. I had all those that you see are in there. When I showed the collection up at DeLand at the Museum of Art up there some years later, they were impressed enough that they purchased the entire collection. So if you ever want to see most of those paintings are in that collection up, and it's in the old courthouse building in downtown DeLand in the rotunda there. That's probably the biggest single body of work that I've actually put together. What are some of the historical subjects that you tackled in legendary Florida? Chronologically speaking, I think the earliest I had to do was Ponce de Leon discovering uh, Florida. At that time, it was the 500th anniversary, and I wanted to do something, but I couldn't get anybody interested. Everybody has already booked up for the big event. So I had no prospects to do a painting like that, but I did it anyway, just as a spec. I was lucky enough to have somebody know about it and purchased it as soon as it came off the easel. The best commission I ever had. The Florida House up in Washington, D.C. purchased it. They were such gracious clients. and They had me come up to Washington and partake in some of the events they were doing with the painting. It was great. I thought I was home free. <laughs> the idea was to, to do the painting of St. Austin's loaded with subject matter. There was incident of Francis Drake from England raiding St. Augustine, which I thought was a little unusual. I never put that combination together, but it was something that just cried out to be painted, and I like the painting. There's a lot of things going on there that have those little messages that I like to put in them. It goes up through, the one that I really like is the Negro Fort, which is called Warriors from Bondage. That was a pretty popular painting that holds on to a lot of value. William Bartram, the naturalist that came down here during the 1700s. There's one called Incident at Thomas Creek, which was one that I did for Bob Hawk in the Florida National Guard and is by far one of my favorites. It's about a militia officer for the Royal Army in St. Augustine during the American Revolution. There was an incident on Thomas Creek up north of Jacksonville 
where it was actually a Revolutionary War incident. That painting turned out terrific for what I wanted to show. Seminole War podcast listeners know you for your military paintings, but you expanded beyond that. I wanted to expand beyond just what you might consider military-style history, conflict history, if you will, because there is a lot to Florida history other than the battles that we've been involved in. So I wanted to include people from Florida society that have made a difference one way or the other. Marjorie Rawlings was and is still just universally famous for her books, and especially The Yearling. I figured if anybody spoke to culture more than Marjorie, I don't know. So I decided that I would paint a painting of her that she could represent part of that gentler history that Florida eventually got. (laughs) As soon as I found that, I started getting information well, what about Zora Neale Hurston? I thought, well, I hadn't even thought of it because I wasn't familiar with her. I lived right here near where she grew up. I decided to do some investigation, and sure enough, this was a person that was every bit as romantic about Florida and about her life. And I thought, wow, this is a bookend. I ended up doing both of those paintings because I couldn't make up my mind. <laughs> but they both deserve to be there as well as there's many more. I tried to hit the high spots as much as I could. And then if there's a secondary collection to come out of this, then who knows what that might end up. So what did you end your series of historic Florida paintings with? To the last of the series, in chronological order, was story of the U-123, which was a great story because, and I'd heard it, and I thought, wouldn't that make an interesting painting? I mean, with all of that, you know, it blew up a gas boat. So, I mean, uh, it it couldn't resist that. It was such a challenge to try and do something almost modern, but in a different vein. The story was so great because the commander of that sub hit that oil tanker and it started burning, but it wasn't sinking fast enough and it was going to call the sub hunters in on the scene if they didn't get it sunk faster. So they were going to fire their deck gun into the sides and try and poke them enough holes in it to make it go down faster. And when they realized that beyond the boat, they were close to the St. Pete Beach shoreline, and there was a lot of activity. And he realized that if he missed that boat with any of his rounds, it would go right into St. Pete Beach and probably cause a lot of damage and uh, casualties to civilians. So he elected to take his sub around to the other side of the ship where he could fire confidently into the boat, and if he missed, he missed. In doing so, he lost some precious time because they were on him by then, and they took a couple of hits, and it's a whole story, but he did manage to sink the boat and get back to Germany, and what made it so different is that Jacksonville, the city of Jacksonville, found out about this story. Now, this was after the war, of course. This was uh, later on. They invited him to come back to Jacksonville for a visit and to thank him for what he did during the war. Since then, Jacksonville and this one commander became very close. And I believe, I heard recently that that commander, 105 years old, is still alive in Germany. And I found that incredible. I I can't believe he's still alive now. But the last I heard, he was still kicking and quite a wealthy man (laughs) over in Germany. I mean, the whole story was just fantastic. And I thought, well, I have to include this in there. And there's many more. I just ran out of gas. I sold the collection. I thought, well, now I have to do something else. But I'm always ready to start adding to that one. I've got a couple of ideas that are really good. Of all the works you've done, what's your most favorite? Ooh, I don't know if I have a favorite. I have several favorites that, generally speaking, I like the Flower Hunter as one of my favorites, the William Buffum portrayal, because it just turned out exactly what I wanted to see in the painting. I was able to execute it pretty well, so I'm always happy when that happens. The incident at Thomas Creek is another one of my favorites, uh, the Thomas Brown militia of St. Augustine. That's probably two of my most favorites, but I really don't have a favorite. They're all my favorites for a little while, and then life goes on. I find it's really hard to pick out of, like picking your children, which one do you love the most? (laughs) 
everything is different and it's like meeting a new person you develop a relationship with these paintings i'll tell you to be honest a lot of times i get done with a painting and want to do it all over again just because it was such an experience and i know if i could just do it one more time it could be so much better that's the one thing i have to remind myself because every painting i finish and that I let out, I grade. I grade very strictly on as if I were a teacher and I set it before me and I look at it and I, I scrutinize it for hours, sometimes days, and just study it and find out, okay, now, perspective is not quite the best or that color is not going well in that spot or anything I pick them to pieces I, you know that guy's nose is wrong whatever it is and I will scrutinize them and grade them that's probably a C plus or a, a D or an A I don't write it down or anything it's just for my own part of the practice go back and think about what could change that for the better and hopefully you'll get a chance to do something similar another time ahead and you'll know better, and you'll do a better rendering of what it is you're trying to do. When I did the National Guard show last year, a lot of that work, was early work that I did for Bob Hawk, a lot of those paintings aren't really as good as I. I wouldn't release them today. Every one of them has something wrong, because I was a lot less of a painter then than I am now. Something didn't look right in a lot of different paintings in a lot of different cases and I used to be embarrassed about that and how come I'm not better and now that I am hopefully better I go back and I looked and I and the first thing I thought was my god I can't let people see these I stopped and thought you're an artist and think of it a little different now I took on the thought that they are less than what I would do today but it shows to the public the progression that it takes to become a better artist. They might say, well, that sure looks crooked there. And then they see, well, this doesn't look crooked. So he learned something. In other words, it's still a teaching. People can see from my mistakes and my earlier work, the progression to becoming hopefully a more accomplished artist as time goes on. As long as that's happening, I guess that's a good thing. I don't have really anything sorry to say about a mistake I made. What's important to me is that I can learn from it and not make that same mistake. And every painting gets better. But every painting from the very first ones I did, there is some spots within that painting, if not most of the paint, that are really, really very good. Even at a younger age, I thought, how did I do that? And why can't I do it again? It does take on a, a little different important in that way. Out of all the paintings you've done, Jackson, what do you say is the most unique or unusual among them? I think the most unique or unusual piece would be the submarine picture, because it comes totally from a story, a true story, just the time period. And it was interesting because there isn't a lot of color and detail to the painting. It's almost what they call a monochromatic painting, a one-color painting. Painting fire is always a challenge, and it's interesting to paint, and it's really fun. And so I just got, I can paint a ship full of gas blowing up. How cool is that? And at night, even better. It was just the visual idea that was in my mind. All I could see was that bright orange blow up of that boat and worked it from there. Also, another one of my favorites is a captive Osceola, which I think is one of my all-time favorites. That scene came around. I knew I wanted to do something about that story, about him being paraded through St. Augustine on the way to the Castillo. I just didn't know how I was going to handle it. I had a blank canvas up there, and I was scrutinizing it one night, and I had my earphones on, and this piece of music came on that was very striking. And as soon as that music came on, this image flashed into my mind about what this painting was going to be. Sure enough, it was such a strong sensation of that music and that image in my mind together that I thought, well, that's the answer. There it is. And it basically, that captive Osceola is almost verbatim what was 
in my skull when I was looking at that blank square. When that happens, I mean, it's it's heaven. You just think, wow, I am an artist. Whoa. Then reality sets in and you have to go back to back to school. It's things like that that make it, I guess, different than pretty much anything else. Your legendary Florida works that focus on the Seminole Wars are, of course, available in a book. But one can also see it displayed in t-shirts. These are called wearable art. What's the story behind this? The t-shirts... When Debbie Harper asked me about wanting to do this and everything, I thought it was a good idea, but I thought, well, do people really, do you think they would wear a T-shirt of a bunch of people fighting, you know? I wondered if that would go or if that would be a somehow somebody would take offense at that. I wasn't sure. So I told Debbie, I said, well, there's plenty of really neat seminal war paintings we could use and you're welcome to use any and all of them for your project but i would stay away from the battle scenes for the t-shirt and i don't know if people agree with me but it just seemed like it was a good idea at the time since there was plenty of others that weren't combat scenes generally speaking that would make good t-shirts and explain the message just as well without the violence. I know that sounds a little wussy, but I worry about my clients. I would hate to have bad remarks. Do you see that guy's t-shirt? You know, who are those people? These days, you have to think about offending for the least reason. And I don't want anything to reflect badly on the foundation or me. So <laughs> that was the only stipulation I asked Debbie. So it's something to keep in mind when you do select a piece of artwork especially if we do it publicly for a t-shirt, that it has enough adventurous appeal, but something that people don't have to question you for 45 minutes about who are these people and what's going on on their t-shirt. Of course, you might want that, though, you know? <laughs> Please elaborate on why you went with this direction. The main reason is because they showed aspects of the war without the banneting of human beings or the guns blazing. For the most part, it's the activity of the war without the explicit violence of the war. I thought for what we stand for in the organization has always been in my mind to recognize the terrible circumstances that we did go through both sides. I think our organization is just a way of saying, well, this is one way we can make that never happening and we can make things better by just understanding each other. And I think that was the beginning of the concept of the foundation. And in the spirit of that, I just decided, now if it's a gun battle going on that you want, got to have your gun battle. So I don't make any hard, fast rules about it. But that was my first suggestion. That was really my only concern. If you want to get more, I don't know, adventuresome and daring, there's one that I would love to see on the T-shirt is with Lacucci Abyss. I think that's a striking piece. That's a brawl, but it's not a disturbing painting if you're used to military art. That would be a terrific one. And there's still a couple on there that with a little explanation to what's going on in the painting for those who might be curious enough to ask, would be candidate for further T-shirts. Or we might want to do something altogether different if we carry on it. The only reason I made a stipulation, I told Debbie, I says, well, of course, I don't know. I've never done my art on T-shirts. I had never thought of very seriously because that's more or less cartoon work or something funny. I'd never saw my work being on a T-shirt, but Debbie was so excited about the idea, and she was sure this was a good thing and got me excited. And I said, well, what have we got to lose? I've got the artwork, and if you all want to do it and find the means to do it, then it's a done deal as far as I'm concerned because that's one of the great things I enjoy out of my whole career is being of use. I've always thought that was a good way to live. If I can do a favor, and Debbie had some good ideas, so it's been a real, real good endeavor, and I hope we continue to do well. My only thing, as I told Debbie, is that I want to have a hand in it only because I want to make sure my artwork is done well when they reproduce it and that the T-shirts look good. Whatever we have to do, put a border around them to make them pop, whatever. We just make sure that they look good because they represent us. It's a special enough project to where the effort is worth it. 
I'm all for it. I think she's done a wonderful job about putting this all together and a joy to work with. So what could be wrong? And that's something I appreciate about Debbie is she insisted of using a very good quality shirt because these aren't inexpensive shirts to buy. And I want to make sure people spend that money. And she feels the same way that they get the best that we can offer them. And she's wanted a good quality shirt. It costs us a little more out of pocket, but it's worth it when you see the results. It's, it's a good thing all the way around. I am so proud of what they've done. I have good hopes. I hope we can do some more of these and some other projects that may come up. For those who'd like to see what wearable art is on sale, please visit our website for the foundation, SeminoWars.org. Our first t-shirt from the Seminole Wars Foundation featured two reenactors that you painted. One portrays a Seminole and one portrays a black Seminole. Why did you paint this? I love that painting. Two of my favorite people, Swamp Owl, Paul Morrison, and John Griffin, who I dearly miss. That guy was so sweet. He made such an impression on me, just who he was. We were at a reenactment and they were there together. I had my camera and I thought, wow, that's almost a painting right there. And I asked John and Bob Powell, would you hold that pose for a minute? Let me get a picture. And I did. And I never thought anything about it until one day I was looking at the picture and I said, I've got to paint it. So I just took a picture and just portrayed what was in that. I added the rifles because I wanted the name. But I thought, if nothing else, these two guys deserve to have their picture painted for no other reason. But it turned out to be a, a really delightful painting. I just love that thing. And it makes a great T-shirt, too, to, as a segue. <laughs> you wanted high quality, and Debbie pledges that the wearable art will probably last as a T-shirt longer than the wearer. I don't know what to think about that. I think it explains the product pretty well. So if nobody's offended by it, I think it makes a good statement. It serves its purpose. If it's uh, considered a wearable art, so be it. It's a marketing phrase that she has used in the past, and I think she thinks it probably helps out with her people that she's pitching to that they find that appealing. And I'm all for it. But that's where that came up with. That's totally Debbie being a marketer. Jackson, so we're bringing you back for a second episode where you go into greater detail about a number of your paintings that were just on the Seminole War. But for now, we're out of time. Thanks for joining us for the Seminole Wars. It's my pleasure entirely. This has been a delight for me. If you enjoyed this show, please take a moment to like us on Facebook at Seminole Wars Foundation. Leave a review on iTunes or your favorite podcast provider. Your reviews and comments help new listeners discover us and help us keep this show going. Visit our website at www.seminolewars.us for blogs, articles, news, books, events, membership information, and how to subscribe to this podcast. We'll be back soon with a new episode of the Seminole Wars Podcast. The Seminole Wars Foundation is a 501c3 nonprofit organization dedicated to preservation, education, and publication of Seminole Wars history throughout the state of Florida. This podcast is copyrighted. The Seminole Wars Foundation, 2022. All rights reserved. Front bumper music, The Devil's Garden. Roast em, provided by kind permission of Rita Youngman. Back bumper music, Second Seminole Win, by Jed Merrim and Ricky Pittman, courtesy of Ricky Pittman. All rights reserved.